Good afternoon. I'm uh, Michael Ignatieff, Rector and President of Central European University. Um, you have already voted with your feet. You have come in large numbers um, for a wonderful panel on evidence-based policymaking, challenges and opportunities featuring Nobel laureate Robert Engel. On behalf of the university, I want to uh, in warmly welcome uh, Professor Engel and his wife to this gathering. Thank you very much for being here. One of the uh, delightful features of our little local difficulties has been the extraordinary support that we've had from some of the most distinguished academic thinkers and researchers in the world. And this is another occasion in which we take particular pride in welcoming a man who's a, a, a laureate in his field, one of the most distinguished economists in the world, joined by some very distinguished people from our own university, Laios Bokros, Julius Horvath, and Andrea Weber. And uh, the whole event is an example also of something else that we have to like, which is cooperation and engagement between two parts of CU, the School of Public Policy, and the Department of Economics and Business. So it's all good news all the way, folks. And, um, and I'm delighted to see uh, so many students here packing into this event. And I'd just like to say one thing before I hand it over to Martin Kahanik. As everybody knows, we're a school with a mission, an open society mission. Uh, one aspect of this mission is absolutely on point for this discussion, which is if you ask what it is a university does to further an open society, that is a free society, a democratic society, it is the place of all places that has to care about evidence, knowledge, facts, as opposed to opinions, tweets, rumors, prejudices, biases, whatever. I think all of us have had a sense in the last couple of years, whatever your politics, whether it's politics on the left or politics on the right, that our democracies have not always been making policy on the basis of evidence. And the place that has to care about evidence-based analysis and policy making is the kind of place you're in here. That's what we do. That's what we care about. Whether we like the evidence or whether we don't like the evidence, whether it suits liberal progressive ideas or whether it hits them hard on the head, right? Whether it supports conservative agendas or liberal agendas, we have to have the guts as a university to care about evidence, care about knowledge, and let it take our recommendations where that evidence leads us to. And so I can't be more delighted to have this university doing this because it fits so perfectly what we are all about. And I'm going to go down and listen and hand it over to Martin and thank all the panelists for being here, but particularly our distinguished special guest. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for uh, introducing uh, the panel. Well, uh, it's also my great pleasure to welcome all of you, ladies and gentlemen, at this uh, event here in the room, uh, but also those following us, us online. Uh, Evidence-based policymaking, uh, challenges and opportunities is the title, and this is the second stint of a, of a debate we are now at SPP starting at, uh, uh, to develop further. and. Uh, and uh, this time, this is a uh, joint event with the uh, Department of Economic and Business. I'm particularly grat grateful for, uh, you know, uh, for this, uh, this cooperation. Well, um, if you think about uh, the current world, we have a growing distrust in authorities, and, uh, and that is uh, uh, in academia, but also policymaking, and that gives us tough times in terms of, you know, how we can sustain the paradigm of evidence-based policymaking uh, uh, out there. We have deepening polarization, radicalization of, uh, of the society. And uh, well, then the challenge for scientists is how can we respond to this uh, growing complexity and what can we do to, uh, to provide for more constructive and more fruitful uh, policy debates. 
So let me just let me introduce uh, the distinguished panelists here. Uh, Professor Engel, uh, 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 after completing his PhD studies at Cornell University, he became professor of economics at MIT. Uh, he was a professor of economics at the University of California in San Diego and currently in New York University uh, Stern uh, School of uh, Business, where is uh, Michael Ar Armelino, professor in management and financial services. And as we all know, he's a Nobel Prize laureate in 2003 for methods of analyzing economic time series with time rank volatility. Uh, professor Andrea Weber, uh, uh, at the Department of Economics and Business at CU. She uh, was formerly Professor of Labor Economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, Professor of Economics at the University of Mannheim and Visiting Assistant Professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, professor uh, Lajos Bokros, uh, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at CU, uh, formerly Minister of Finance of Hungary and the father of the Bokros Reform Package uh, and a member of European Parliament 2009-2014. And Professor Julius Horvat, uh, Professor of Economics at CU, formerly acting dean of CU's business school, head of department of economics and also the department of international relations, uh, over time a member of Academia Europea. Now let me change the position here. So when you think about what the key questions might be, well one is of course how we can see our role as scientists in, in, the, in, the, in the world. And that's a general question I would like to ask uh, and invite the panelists to reflect on. What is, the, what is it that we can achieve? What is it that we cannot achieve? Or uh, where is our mandate? And particularly, Professor Engel, I would like to start with you and ask you, how do you see this trade-off when you think about, you know, we can all, as scientists, we can always strive for better evidence, uh, develop better methods. But then there is the other side of that, which is providing our evidence quickly enough for policymaking because policymakers typically are not very happy when we tell them, okay, we have data which is three years old. And then they say, okay, but where is the re more recent data? And there is a trade-off, fundamental trade-off between developing methods but also then responding you know, on demand to policymakers and, and uh, business leaders. Professor Engel. Uh, I think that's all right. You should be able to. Can, can you hear me if I speak from this? Okay, even all the way in the back? Good, okay. Um, yes, I was interested in the, in the title of the session, Evidence-Based Policy, because it seems like it's uncontroversial. Of course, everyone would like to have evidence as to whether their policy is gonna work. What are the consequences of some particular policy? So why should there be a question about evidence-based policy versus some other kind of policy? And I think it's interesting to reflect on that from the, the, the light of your question and the light of the experiences we see in the US and I guess in Europe as well. Um, I'd like to take a sort of a scientific view on this rather than a political view on it. I want to talk about a little bit about the science that's behind making good policy. And then, of course, there are voters. And the question is, how do voters respond to the scientific evidence that might be presented? And if it's not can't be explained in 30 seconds on the TV, is it really going to be uh, influential in, in helping voters make good decisions? And if voters don't make good decisions, will policymakers make good decisions? Um, well, I have several anecdotes I, I wanted to talk about. Let, let me just talk about one at this point, and then we could come back, which is climate change. Because in a sense, climate change is a really good example of this choice, since science is pretty much convinced that climate change is a real problem that our planet faces in the future. And I guess the evidence is very clear but it's still incomplete from the point of view of how are we supposed to respond to it. 
And so there is a great deal of research that still needs to be done. Nevertheless, the there are experts who have clear opinions that I think are right. And so how are politicians supposed to make decisions after f getting this, uh, this evidence? Well, one of the things that must be very obvious about climate change is that if we imp put in place policies which mitigate the damages we expect from climate change, there will be some clear winners and losers. And this is always the land of politics. Who are you going to respond to, the winners or the losers? And so it's rather difficult to put in place policy, even though it's evidence-based, if you are particularly concerned about the losers, or if you're particularly concerned about the winners. In this case, it's also complicated because the bad consequences that we're worried about are very far in the future, whereas the winners and the losers are going to be winners and losers in the near term. So it's easy to think that the science isn't really going to answer this question effectively because the winners and losers are going to answer the question and it's a short run kind of a question. We may end up making decisions based on short run winners and losers rather than the really the long run costs which we think and the science thinks are uh, astronomical, I mean, I enormous. So the U.S. has withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. Uh, this is pretty upsetting to most of the world who signed the, science, the Paris Agreement. It's actually pretty upsetting to a lot of people in the U.S. as well, and I think reflects a reweighting of the <laughs> the winners and the losers by the, by the current U.S. government, and certainly uh, a focus on short-term gains versus long-term uh, costs. It appears to be a rejection of expert opinion, and in that sense, it's not evidence-based policy to drop out of the, the uh, climate accord, I think. What is likely to happen seems a little more difficult to understand because there are many parts of the U.S. economy that are actually responding in a very positive way to uh, climate change, even though the government is not, and we see the state of California taking the lead. We see municipal governments acting to respond to the climate change. Uh, we see regulation of uh, automobile emissions by the state legislatures may become the dominant paradigm rather than the federal government. So institutions turn out to be a very important part of uh, this, this discussion. So even if um, evidence-based policy is not actually carried out sensibly by the government, it may be that it's carried out sensibly by the private sector or by other levels of government. And the, so it means that the expert opinions uh, are valuable, they're used, and they may push us forward even if it's not done uh, by, the, uh, by our current administration. So let me stop here, and uh, I, I have a few other things I'll say if, uh, if the question comes up. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, very much. Um, Andrea, I know you are in labor, economics, labor policy. Now, that's very close to my heart. Uh, and I can imagine when we are thinking about labor policies, we do have in mind winners and losers. Yes, we do think about what works, what doesn't. How do you, how do you see this? What is your experience? Thank you. 
Yeah, so I am an empirical labor economist and I work a lot on uh, social insurance programs such as unemployment insurance or pension insurance. And uh, as Martin pointed out, there is a lot of uh, policy relevant issues in this line of research. What we've seen in my line of research is uh, that, uh, that uh, large scale administrative record data have become available over the last uh, 10, 15 years in many countries. And this gave a big push to the empirical evidence we can uh, have on, uh, on these kind of programs and these kind of questions. Um, uh, so, for instance, if you change uh, regulations for early retirement, we can have the whole population and see how individuals respond. Do they work longer? Uh, do they run down their savings? Uh, or do they substitute to other uh, insurance programs? Do they go on unemployment or on sick leave or whatever? Uh, so there is now a lot of evidence we can uh, get from this data uh, to estimate models or to pre uh, give predictions uh, of things which have previously only been available uh, from the theoretical side. So there is a lot of good news for evidence-based policy uh, in, in this uh, kind of research. But there is also, of course, a, f a lot of issues that still have to be uh, resolved. Uh, so in terms uh, of this large-scale administrative data, which are collected uh, by government bodies, uh, there is issues with uh, confidentiality and uh, data security, which have only been resolved for single projects, but not on a general scale and uh, with a general uh, understanding. There is issues with giving researchers access to this data because of these uh, confidentiality issues and uh, also issues with uh, knowledge about the data. Uh, there's very restrictive access only, so it's not every uh, researcher that who would you like to use certain kind of data gets access automatically. There's a lot of back and forth uh, negotiations with government, with policy makers who have to understand uh, that these data are necessary and available and uh, a good thing for researchers. And then there's of course also these issues with uh, the communication between policy makers, media and researchers. So there is a lot of room for improvement as well. Uh, so the academics are usually not trained uh, to um, uh, communicate uh, with uh, policy makers or with media either, so I'm, I'm, I, at least I'm not. And uh, on the other hand, the policy makers are oftentimes don't see seek the advice of uh, researchers, even though, uh, like in my case, uh, they, they uh, work on, uh, for a long time on very, very policy relevant uh, questions. So this, this all varies by country and uh, um, uh, by, by, by research area, uh, but I think there's a lot of uh, room uh, for improvement. Uh, what I would like to add also about this uh, administrative data that Europe gained an edge in research over the US because European countries, uh, they collect very comprehensive and detailed uh, registers which are not available uh, for the US. So if there were a big push, this would also um, uh, give a lot of uh, uh, um, bonuses uh, to European researchers, but also to uh, European policy makers. Thank you, Andrea. It's really nice to hear that we are somewhere ahead of, of the US in some subfield. <laughs> Lajos, uh, when I think about evidence-based policy making, uh, what I see is uh, two people that you need to tango. Yes, you need uh, the scientist and the policy maker who so can listen to each other. But you are in a privileged position because you can do both. Uh, you are a prominent academic, prominent uh, policy politician. Yes. So how do you see this? Let me also start with an anecdote. Uh, here in Hungary, we used to have a very large company called Icarus, which was churning out auto buses during the time of the communist system. It was a huge company producing more than 10,000 units per year at the peak of its uh, existence. Now, after the collapse of the communist system, it went immediately bankrupt because the quality was not very good and efficiency was even worse. Now, the first reaction of the political class was to support this large company with uh, fiscal subsidies and uh, different types of state intervention. But there was no result. You mentioned that I was Minister of Finance in this country 22 years ago and happily or unhappily, but at least partially, I was responsible for privatization. So I took a deep breath and proposed to my esteemed Prime Minister to privatize this company 
and uh, I said we shall we should sell it for one Hungarian foreign. <laughs> My prime minister, uh, who has unfortunately died since, and uh, I talk about him with great respect, was stunned, was astonished. He felt my proposal was simply outrageous. He said to me the following, I will never forget that. Lajos Kahn, this is a very nice way of addressing people here. It has fantastic factories, great machinery, huge buildings, thousands of people working there. How on earth you can contemplate selling this thing for one single Hungarian uh, foreign? Unfortunately, he did not understand the distinction between net asset value and gross asset value. <laughs> so it was, with all due respect, ignorance of basic concepts in economy. Um, the good news was that he was interested in learning and filling those gaps which were there in his mind because he was uh, an old-fashioned guy. Today, the problem is that ignorance comes with pride. Today, many politicians are proud of being ignorant and disrespect and disregard the facts completely. Not only evidence, but even most, more basic things like simple facts. And that's why I think now we have to take even a deeper uh, breath and start engaging ourselves in more activity, not only in policy making, but even in politics. I do have a schizophrenic mindset because I'm a politician at the same time. So not only a professor here, but also a policymaker in many countries and a politician at the same time. When I teach my dear students, uh, I start my classes to make a distinction between policy and politics, which is a very important distinction it doesn't exist in many other languages, so the English language is very rich in that respect. And I try to highlight that both are key if you want to see results on the ground. And as a consequence, people should not look down on politics just because it is becoming proudly ignorant of almost every fact, but try to help cross-fertilizing the hearts and minds of people, politicians, institutions, as you mentioned, helping also civil society and asking academia, scientists, researchers to try to push politicians more to the area of reality. I think it's an uphill battle. It's much more difficult today than it used to be 20 years ago, but we have no choice. If you want to be responsible citizens, at the same time uh, we want to see results on the ground, then we have to do this with <coughs> double effort. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Uh, when, when I'm thinking about scientists um, and us, I guess we seem to be on, on, on this side of the debate where we think uh, evidence is clearly good, yes, and the politicians should listen and. Uh, and uh, there is potential for making our world a better place. Uh, but Julius, um, I hope you have a more skeptical perspective on this. <laughs> well, uh, um, I, uh, I, first I am happy that uh, departments cooperate, uh, departments of public school and the Department of Economics and uh, Business. You also asked at the beginning to say something about scientists in the world and what do we think about the world? It's the old problem. It's the problem of philosopher and the prince. Socrates had the problem. You know, people are an opinion. Finally, it is the prince who rules always. And the philosopher needs somehow to accept, uh, but to try to influence the prince so makes decision in a more reasonable way. That's partially the rules of evidence. But I will look at it a little bit from a political view, but begin first with a, uh, Maxim of Sir Humphrey Appleby, 
famous British politician uh, from the television series, yes, Mr. Prime Minister, who said, government should never commission a study without knowing what the answer will be. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's, all, that's a, a partially a bon mot, but it's a deeper. Lord Keynes said uh, similar in a much more sophisticated text that there is nothing government hates more than to be well informed for it makes the process of arriving at decisions much more complicated and difficult. But, and why? Because evidence-based approach to public policy or generally to policy is motivated, it's, it's the old approach, it was there already in the medieval times, is motivated by a desire to discipline the whims of the rulers. If there are non-democratic governments, you know, it's more whimsical rule, you know, but also if in a democratic government to prevent potential bad decision. But there's a large class of politicians who are ideologically driven, either leaders or they rule a the party, and they frame the policy vision upon, upon this. So in that sense, most of the policy is, uh, or a large extent of policy is ideologically based. This ideologically based decision has advantages as it allows the political leaders to justify themselves towards the constituents, which is much more difficult if it is evidence-based, something which is like outside of the politician. And also it allows the political class to keep ideological electoral promises, which some voters uh, appreciate. So without evidence, what can policymaker do? It has ideology of the party or of the country or something, intuition, yeah, or conventional wisdom, or even theory, but it's not. So evidence-based policy, just a couple of more comments. What I see evidence-based policy would require. Would require to have a, you know, less ideological slogans or this type of a changing of the atmosphere in a sense. To have good evidence. Because for, because for evidence-based policy, we not only need to collect data, but we need to collect data correctly and properly. And the data which really represent the variable, you know, which we want uh, the, the data uh, to describe. Uh, we need to have governments which have the ability to discriminate between evidence which is reliable and evidence which is not. Because even in such case, there could be a lot of manipulation uh, from the, even from the scientists, you know, uh, towards the government. We also need to avoid the risk that, the, that, that there need to be a lot of studies which are domestic, which are domestically orientated and not believe that foreign empirical studies are good just because they are empirical. Yeah? They need to be done also with the domestic data. Uh, and uh, there is one issue also that uh, uh, the question of the time and the speed, because sometimes government needs to decide quickly and behind closed doors. Uh, that there are different reasons for it, but one is also that government needs to defend against what can be called opportunistic adversaries. They are in every regime like that. So, uh, and uh, evidence-based requires time. So where is the balance here is, uh, is an important. Two last comments. We don't need only good evidence and good research, but we need to have a good skilled people who understand quantitative methods, like Professor Engler and better, yeah, yeah, but also who have a good incentives to deliver a good product as a, as a, a quantitative analyst. And the last one. These who will provide evidence, uh, the, the, provides the material, which is the base for the evidence-based policy, need to be somehow independent. And this independence is more important for technically oriented research than for people who do opinion, who do research which, which influences <laughs> opinions. Because generally people, the population, is very good at judging opinions for themselves. But the average person is fully mystified by the technical analysis, yeah? And then he wants to be sure that this technical analysis is really performed with, you know, uh, uh, with <coughs> competency and a good results. And we know from a lot of different uh, subjects where people try to, you know, uh, replicate studies of the top papers, not actually economics or business, but in some other fields. And it's very difficult to replicate. So, so the problem is, in that sense, you know, complex. Thank you, Julius. Uh, that reminds me of uh, one banner which appeared in DC April 22nd in the March for Science. 
where thousands of people marched, uh, and their actually slogan was evidence-based policy making. So there was a march supporting use of science for policy making. One of those banners said, uh, we need evidence-based policy making after peer review. Yeah, so we need, is, would, that be, would that be helpful, peer review? Um, yes, of course, you know, peer review is helpful because it means more eyes see more things or some, this is some common issue that's good, yeah. But let me remind you <laughs> of, uh, of the, again, Sir Humphrey Aplebim, who on the question whether in democracy surely citizens need to know things. He says, well, citizens also have a right to be ignorant because knowledge means complicity in guilt of government. <laughs> Why ignorance can give you certain dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Rob, over to you. Uh, um, I remember your talk uh, uh, where you introduced uh, VLAB, which is uh, an endeavor where you try to measure volatility of stock markets, and the underlying motive, or at least one of those, as I understood, was to be able to predict crises or problems. Uh, uh, is this a way how to, you know, is, does this endeavor, you think, contribute to, you know, providing evidence for, well, general public, stakeholders, and politicians, perhaps? Yes, uh, um, we, we do think that one of the reasons why the volatility laboratory is, is useful is that it, it does come up with estimates of where there are risks in the financial markets on a frequent basis, like every day, and makes this available to anyone in the world who wants to look at it on the internet. And that includes politicians. Uh, should they choose to look at it. it well, the financial markets are actually a, a good place to think about evidence-based policy because they're so complicated. They're so complicated that you really wouldn't want to expect the electorate to do, understand the details of the financial markets and vote on on policies, you would like to have the experts, in fact, act themselves. And this is actually one of the reasons why we have independent central banks. And for example, Ben Bernanke was already an expert on the Great Depression when the financial crisis hit in 2007 and was able to act very quickly to respond to this crisis. And actually, I think that central banks around the world were very good at doing this. It's fortunate that we didn't have to wait for public policy, which would have been much slower to, to respond to this, and might not have understood the issues quite as clearly as the experts did. So this is the advantage of doing research like the V-Lab, but on, on many topics where we understand better how these complex systems work and this evidence can be pre ready in case there is a crisis that comes up in the future and we wouldn't rely on, on the political process necessarily to analyze it. I think, in fact, an awful lot of the issues that are the sort of topics we're discussing today are so complicated compared to the way people understand them that it's it's they're not a, that the experts need somehow to figure out how to communicate these complicated ideas to people so that they can actually make good decisions as to, you know, who to support in, in some political contest that, that is coming up. And that's, that's a challenge for the experts. And, and so VLAB is perhaps an example of how this can reach people. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh I'm very happy to see so many people interested in the debate, so I trust uh, you also have many questions, and uh, I think the panel is uh, as good as, uh, you know, as many questions are asked, so I now I invite 
you to address questions to the panelists. Uh, do we have a question? Yes, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Microphone, please. And now? Yes. Okay, so my name is Georgiana. I'm finishing my PhD here, and I'm interested in migration. And obviously, as you would imagine, my field is also, although it's very philosophical, or at least that's the point of view I take, uh, it is what I do, what I think, it's also very relevant to policy and to the real world. So uh, one thing that I find a little difficult in academia is um, to do other things other than, you know, big journals. Whatever takes you to the career steps, the steps that are necessary to, you know, professorship and so on. And I find that there is uh, mm, relatively, or at least in my view, um, uh, resistance uh, to doing other type of things. For example, pu publishing in blogs, publishing entries that are also understandable to the common person or to the politician, or what we call, let's say, the well-informed person. I'm not going to necessarily want to inform everyone because I know that then what I'm doing obviously becomes too uh, diluted. But at least inform other people uh, other than the small circle I'm talking to in the conversation. And so I was wondering, is academia moving towards that? For example, by uh, giving credit to also these other types of work or, for example, <coughs> by not looking down on academics who also build a profile that is, in this sense, less academic. So, what is your recommendation, given that this is precisely where all of you, I think, pointed as a necessity in, uh, in our times? Thank you. Sorry for the length. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent question. Anyone would like to react? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, so this is exactly the point I was making, that it is uh, extremely important uh, to improve this communication uh, between uh, academic researchers on the one hand, pro, uh, uh, the, 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 the public on the other hand, and the policy makers. So anything that, uh, that can help improve this is, I think, very, very welcome, especially as our research is now not uh, the whatever ivory tower uh, theoretical research anymore, but there is a lot of uh, empirical research which can, uh, which can inform um, the public. But of course, we have to also keep in mind what Professor Engel said, that some of these uh, things are so complex that it is really hard to uh, get this uh, to people. Another example would be the tax policies. Taxes are extremely uh, complex and uh, uh, hard to understand. Uh, it might be nice to, to, to convey a certain idea and a certain um, 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 a strategy to the general public, but uh, we will never succeed in, a, in explaining the whole tax schedule to the uh, to the to, uh, to people. But uh, I think any efforts uh, to improve this communication is uh, is highly welcome from all sides. I think, and this will uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be rewarded uh, in the future. Yes, please. Thank you. It, it seems to me that even as academics, we have a hard time figuring out what's the right answer to some question. And we do our research and we can come up with sometimes conflicting opinions. But over time, these get resolved. And the question of how is this supposed to get translated to public and public officials who have to make decisions in the short run is your question. And I think the answer is that there are going to be intermediaries who will be able to read the academic research, distill it, and decide what really the fundamental features are, write these in, for example, textbooks, popular news outlets, and so forth, and actually serve an intermediary function between the complexity of academics and, and public policy. And if they do a good job, it's an incredible service. If they do a bad job, then it's important that there be critics in that level as well, saying, well, you didn't really correctly interpret this. 
study or that study or the evidence that is there. So it's, it moves it to another level, but it, it means that the experts should have a voice, even if they don't do it themselves, to the uh, public arena. You lose? I, I, I agree with you that uh, the academy is very com is extremely competitive, so it's difficult uh, and it's not surely prestige. Uh, you don't get a rise in a prestige in academia by writing good blogs or articles, and it's even you know the most famous people who write are sometimes criticized inside. So we don't have a we don't have a channel for that, uh, and uh, and. Um, and maybe the Czech Academy of Sciences gives every two years or every year a prize for a person for a best popularization in, of the mathematics, physics, and astronomy. Yeah, I think that this is the activity, activity like that. And then of course, maybe in economics or social sciences, there is also one other issue, uh, evidence and this theory that I remember reading uh, years ago, uh, uh, Ahmad uh, Modigliani. Uh, or Modigliani was a leading Keynesian in the 60s and 70s, a great scientist, and he had to give a lecture in his uh, in Italy, uh, Matteo Raffaelli lectures, and there he said that, and he's still with me, <coughs> that the difference between me and Milton, which is Milton Friedman, the f the, the 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 monetary, uh, so the different school than Keynesian, began before we entered economic science. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it, it shows that something else is also important, and maybe we should respect more and and protect more in academia or help those who who do do these active uh, do these activities because it's very good to speak to the uh, more general public and send the the ideas from academia. Thank you, thank you. So. Um, this is a very fundamental question. I think one, one, one answer from me, if you like, would be you always have to do what's close to your heart. And I'm very you know, proud of uh, the School of Public Policy that we actually value academic excellence and at the same time engagement with policy challenges and policy issues and practical issues. So, so uh, that's, uh, I think, our answer to your question. Uh, I see a question over there, gentlemen. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Attila Avas. Uh, I would like to make two observations, which can be turned to, into questions as well, of course. So my understanding is that you, you have already stressed the complexity of, of this interaction between uh, researchers and policymakers, but my observation would be that actually uh, we, we have different paradigms in economics, in, in various fields of, of economic research, and these paradigms do not agree. So if, if I, my, usually I study innovation policy, and, and there are at least three, if not four, policy rationales, rationales derived from various economic paradigms. So the, the role of intermediaries, as, as Professor Engel mentioned, is important indeed, but uh, which type of intermediaries are, or translators are, are chosen, that, that can be de decisive. So that, that's one issue that we, we don't have a single uh, economics uh, advice, uh, uh, approved or accepted uh, by all, all, all different researchers or schools. The, I think the other uh, level of complexity is that besides scientists, researchers, and policymakers, we also have policy shapers in, in most countries, uh, politicians who have more power than policymakers, and we have stakeholders as well. Uh, in the field of labor policy, probably trade unions are very important. In the field of innovation policy, various types of businesses, uh, financial uh, organizations, uh, big uh, research organizations, users of, of innovation. So it's unfortunately, ju just to wrap up, it's, it's more complex because of, of the various paradigms we have in different fields of economics or other science, if, if we think, uh, think in terms of environmental policies, for instance. And we, we have more than two players, not just policymakers and, and researchers. Thank, Thank you. Laos, please. Uh, yes, it is part of the complexity that we have <laughs> hundreds of stakeholders, and they may have their own 
vested interests, not only in interpreting, but also in understanding uh, what comes out of uh, science. I would like to emphasize perhaps two things. One is transparency. So if we have a level playing field among opinion leaders and opinion makers so that they can have access to those type of uh, uh, intermediaries which will then hopefully work in a proper way to communicate uh, those results which have been achieved in science and then translate into policy or even political slogans sometimes which is equally important, then we are probably uh, much better served than in an opaque situation where it is very difficult to communicate with those stakeholders and there is no level playing field. There is an even more fundamental issue and uh, it just came to my mind when uh, Professor Engel was talking about this uh, uh, complexity of the financial uh, markets. Uh, uh, yes, uh, if I uh, may just evaluate uh, the state of affairs in the US financial markets as an observer, um, I uh, like that type of complexity because at least uh, the role of the different institutions which are there and uh, which have a very important role to play, uh, it is clear, more or less. You mentioned the independent central bank, and of course it is not independent, it should be accountable, but it is autonomous in the sense that within the parameters of the law, it can use its own instruments and uh, uh, apply them uh, in a more or less uh, uh, scientific way. Uh, but again, uh, we learned uh, recently that uh, sometimes verbal intervention is more important than real intervention. As a consequence, convincing the market uh, that uh, what the central bank is actually doing is the right thing. And uh, when it comes to credibility of uh, these actions, uh, you know, verbal intervention matters as much as, as real intervention. So again, we, we, we just have to remind ourselves that in other parts of the world we have a little bit more miserable uh, situation. For example, in this country the uh, central bank is far from being independent in that respect, plus the central bank is not only just a central bank, a monetary authority, but also uh, the supervisory authority about macro prudential supervision and uh, and uh, 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 financial sector supervision, plus it owns the stock exchange. So what we have is built-in conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Now to create a level playing field in that type of a situation is a tall order. But we have to uh, realize uh, those impediments and uh, uh, fight for the, the re-establishment of a uh, much better situation whereby there are no too many institutional impediments for those transparent uh, market of knowledge to flourish and to accumulate enough of uh, evidence uh, in order to influence uh, policymakers and politicians in the proper way. Thanks. So, Rob, did you want to react on this? You know, I, I agree with that very much. I think transparency is, is terribly important. That's one of the reasons why, as academics, we publish all our papers, we, uh, we uh, typically publish our data, our, our uh, software that estimates it. We invite people to reproduce our estimates on their own data or our data, <coughs> whatever. And this is a way in which uh, evidence is actually strengthened by, by uh, people seeing it from, from several different points of view. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I saw a question by the gentleman, please. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, so I'm concerned my question is going to come out as rhetorical, but it's not. It's a sincere question. I don't know the answer. Uh, I am from the Cognitive Science Department. And in Cognitive Science, we know a fair bit about 
how different ideas and different scientific findings are more intuitive to the human mind than are others. There's variation here, in, and climate change is a big and obvious example of something that's actually quite challenging for the human mind to handle. Um, the, the success of vac vaccines is also quite a difficult concept. Uh, my question is, to, and, and there are people in cognitive science not only studying these things, but also studying how, you, how to get over those barriers. You know, how can you persuade people to accept ideas that run counter to some of their natural intuitions? So my question is, to what extent, and I, I stress, I really don't know the answer, to what extent is this literature known about, discussed, and otherwise having an impact in your, the disciplines you're familiar with, economics, political science, and so on? So the, the literature that he's talking about is... It's, it's yeah. the, uh, there's a lit, large literature in cognitive science about how some ideas, rather than others, uh, fit or don't fit with our natural intuitions and dispositions about how the world works. And there are also, there's also a literature on how to persuade people to accept the findings of science and how some ideas are more easily communicated to the public than are others. And I'm just curious about the extent to which that, the, that literature has crossed over into where it matters. Well, I would say economists are, are not typically focused on that question. They're more focused on the question of how does the world work? What do we see when we measure it? What are the theories that explain what we see? Rather than how uh, to f fit these results into the paradigms that people have. If I understand your, I would say that's more a, 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 a topic for political science or, or maybe understanding uh, the, the, the process of government and maybe uh, things in that vein. I, I think it's relevant for this discussion, but I don't know that economists have a great answer for you, unless someone else wants to. <laughs> I see the panel is nodding, uh, so it's yeah, uh, let, could I Could I tell one more right, anecdote right. From, from the U.S., which I think is really germane to this question of uh, evidence-based policy. It turns out that that the state of Kansas in the U.S., which is in the Midwest, it's a, typically a Republican uh, state, in 2010 elected its senator to be governor. That's Sam Brownback. Brownback. And he had an agenda which he implemented, which was to lower taxes and lower expenditures dramatically. So this was a state which put into place a, a paradigm that has been discussed and proposed in political circles, but really didn't have any uh, in, much empirical evidence to support it. Uh, over the next few years, there were a series of budget crises and legal crises the legal crises came because the school systems were not getting the money that they were entitled to, and this went to the state Supreme Court. The budget crises came because job growth was very slow and tax revenues were low, and the state was on the verge of bankruptcy. It, in subsequent elections, uh, the Republican were, were, many of them were reelected, and some change in the uh, membership, but the new uh, Congress of, of the state, the State House, actually overturned the governor's policies and overturned his veto of these policies, which is an example of a very short-term uh, 
learning about the effectiveness of policy. Uh, and this, I think, is an interesting example of why politicians should be interested in evidence-based uh, policy, because they really don't want to imp uh, be launching policies that aren't going to work. If they launch policies that don't work, ultimately they're going to get voted out of office and they're not going to be considered to be successes. And so I would think that it's not actually a conflict between evidence-based policy and successful governing. I think they should be working together. Thank you. One last question. Yes, Peter, please. Thank you. I am Peter Moller, and I was also a politician for a decade. And my question is that if the choice is whether politicians choose short-term political advantage or fact-based policy making, is it possible to communicate the facts uh, strongly enough that politicians and perhaps more importantly the public or the majority of the public see that it's not only the long-term benefit but it's also the short-term short -term damage that policy making without facts cause. So this way is it possible to sort of non-violently eliminate the choice of short-term stupid political advantage. Please tell it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes. Sometimes it is possible, but not always. I think it is important to uh, take into consideration the uh, intertemporal nature of uh, reforms. You are referring to some of those reforms which uh, uh, maybe in the very long run can produce uh, a very good results, but uh, obviously in the short run uh, there are losers and uh, you have costs. In my humble experience, I can only say that uh, two things may help. It, it does not always help, but it may help. One is honesty and sincerity. So you tell the electorate and you tell the people that there are no ideal choices. Uh, there are only optimal choices in the sense that there might be in a Pareto optimal outcome where probably at least in a longer term horizon most of the people, most of the stakeholders in society will be better off as a consequence of uh, these reforms. One of the most important example in this area is the pension reform, where of course the costs are uh, almost immediate, uh, benefits may come only in 50 years time. But we have to be able to explain that. And in certain countries, in certain periods, it was successful. So we can't say that it is impossible. At the same time, uh, there is another important uh, 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 condition or initial condition or starting point. Uh, I'm, I don't want to sound cynical, but uh, <laughs> Professor Engel started with Kansas and uh, his initial condition was democracy. Now, we don't have democracy everywhere. We don't have liberal democracy everywhere. Sometimes we have only illiberal democracy, which doesn't, pro doesn't necessarily produce a level playing field. And we still have to be honest, I think, uh, when it comes to designing uh, uh, structural reforms and when we want to convince the people that it is in their interest to uh, buy into those reforms. So it is very hard, yes, and the answer is yes and no. Sometimes we win and sometimes we lose. It is not a reason for not trying. Okay. Rob, please. The, we, we have set up something in the U.S. which actually tries to address this problem, which is the Congressional Budget Office. It's a nonprofit organization funded by the federal government, which has the mandate to examine the long-term as well as the short-term, but it's 
they have a, a 10 year horizon for the costs and benefits of policies that are being considered by Congress. In fact, this featured prominently in the healthcare debate that we've recently had in the sense that, that Congress was trying to make come to a vote before the CBO had a chance to assess the costs and benefits of the health care reforms they were doing. And, you know, this, it gave them like a week to come up with an analysis of these complicated mm -hmm. cases. But having this institution that actually has a lot of credibility on both sides of the political spectrum and has the responsibility of reporting the long-term costs and benefits is actually a very strong institutional framework to help us with these okay. kinds of questions. And, and if the institution can maintain its credibility in the face of a lot of political uh, wrangling, it actually provides a, a lot of information and a lot of transparency on these kinds of questions. Thanks, Rob. I'm sure I said two final questions because I see my rector wants to. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay. okay. In that case, uh, I invite the panelists if you have any last uh, remarks, maybe what the key challenge for the next uh, year or two or, uh, are for the concept if you want to push for it and, uh, and uh, what should we tell our students? What should they focus on? So, just a very small, I think, uh, at some countries, let's say if I narrow it down to the Central or Eastern Europe, Little Balkan, at some countries there is an attempt or there almost, there almost there are institutions with a credibility on the both sides of the aisle, both political sides. At some countries, not. And I think for the countries where they, they are, like uh, there were cases uh, when the, for example, the Fiscal Council in Slovakia was voted in, was voted in, you know, by the left and the right wing, even if the people came from one political spectra, they were respected economists and they were, they were, you know, voted for. So to find uh, such situations, or to build such institution, which uh, have a high credibility generally in the society and are not clearly politically oriented, it may be for evidence-based policy a good uh, beginning or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Thank you. Blaj? Just again, uh, a small comment to this uh, <laughs> Congressional Budget Office. I like the term because it says congressional, so it's not political, not party political in the sense, but it belongs to the Congress and it is supposed to give so-called, you know, objective, more or less fact-based evidence uh, before votes uh, taking place. Now, it reminds me again uh, in my uh, cynical way to what happened in this country. Uh, when, when the government did not like uh, uh, the opinion of the, we called it fiscal council, it was abolished. So there's no such an institution anymore in this country and that's uh, one way to quote unquote solve uh, the problem. Uh, so my final comment to my distinguished uh, Slovak uh, friends, uh, neighbors and uh, and uh, 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 brothers, yes, uh, we cherish uh, competition in the economy. That's why we like a market economy and prefer a market economy over the command economy. We cherish also political competition because we feel democracy uh, is not only more efficient but also more humane. Uh, and comes with uh, more satisfaction ultimately in societal life. And uh, finally, uh, uh, this is important if you have, you know, competition in a small country, both uh, economically and politically, then finally what you want is, a, is an open society and an open economy. And that's uh, probably the, the end result, what we want to, you know, cherish even more and instill into the hearts and minds of our own students in order for them to be able to become champions in their own countries because we have students, very, very bright and distinguished students from many countries where this kind of a open society is still in jeopardy. Thank you, Laos. Andrea? 
So what we should tell our students about, <laughs> I think uh, one important thing to teach the students would be to uh, see research not as an abstract concept, but as something that has to be just translated into uh, politics, uh, into public opinion. So always ask yourself, what are the policy implications of my research? How would I translate uh, this into an efficient policy? And also how would I explain to the uh, general public what I found uh, and what, uh, uh, what this means for the world? Thank you. Rob? Well, I think what you've both said is what I wanted to say, which is how exciting it is to do research that has policy relevance. It's, it's breathtaking, and this is something that I think many of you will enjoy and feel, that you feel like you're, you're doing something for the good of society, for the good of your country, for the good of many people, and it's exciting. And there is an excitement about research and education that we all, I think, love up here, and I uh, hope you will enjoy it too. I think there is nothing to add except that thank you so very much for an exciting panel. Uh, thank you all for coming, for active questions, and thank you.